Hello and welcome back to the Wasteland everybody, welcome back to Fallout New Vegas, where today we're going to be doing a companion tier list of all the companions in Fallout New Vegas, which I've been asked a lot to do and I just haven't gotten around to it, so today is the day that we're actually getting around to this. I was thinking of maybe putting all the companions from the Fallout games in here, at least the major ones or mainline games, but I decided that New Vegas would probably be enough just for the one. We're also not going to be going over temporary companions for this, with I guess one exception here. So let's begin this and let's go over our categories where we have the Wasteland warriors I think these are probably the best companions maybe they can be best in one way or another maybe they have a really good story maybe they have a really good personality maybe they have a really good perk which we're gonna be talking about all of those things then we have reliable allies pretty solid ones we have the occasional partners ones that I don't usually take but they can be pretty useful and then we have the mediocre companions which is about as low as I would say any of the companions really get in Fallout New Vegas for the most part the companions in this game are quite good for one reason or another because of their personality because of their stories because of their missions with them. Let's begin with Arcane Ganon. So Ganon is a companion that you can get as soon as you get to Freeside in Vegas and to get him you either need to have so much affinity towards the followers of the apocalypse that he joins you, complete various missions for them which can help up your reputation, or you can pass some skill checks with him to get him as a companion. If you're dumb enough he'll actually take pity on you and join your group which is funny. I think you need three or less intelligence to do that. And then if you also are a male and you have the perk confirmed bachelor, you can also get him, which uh, gives you unique dialogue with other male characters as well as it allows you to do more damage towards other male characters. That one tends to be better than like Lady Killer for men because it just makes it a little bit easier since you're usually fighting more men. And if you want Arcade Ganon on your team, you can easily get him there. Ganon's a pretty interesting character overall. I really do like his backstory, even though he's very... Uh, not forthcoming with his backstory. He doesn't really want to talk about it, kind of for obvious reasons since he was part of the Enclave originally, and the Enclave are not held in high regards in the Wasteland by pretty much anybody besides the Enclave. He mostly sides with the NCR, he really does not like Caesar at all. He is a very intelligent character, which is pretty cool. He uses energy weapons because he has his Plasma Defender that he uses as a regular weapon, which is good, and I think he's got a Ripper as a secondary. I don't remember, I don't really see him using secondaries all that much. Also, I don't always have companions on my runs because usually I'm playing on Hardcore, and on Hardcore if the companions die, that means they're dead and you can't complete their quests. So I usually try to keep them alive as much as possible and usually don't get them until I'm rather overpowered so I can complete their stories. In order to complete his story, you're gonna have to go to various areas and these are sometimes timed events to where they can only happen at certain points throughout the story where you do need to take him to certain areas and then say specific things to him. This will get up his affinity and then once that's maxed out, you can actually complete his quest which is for the Enclave Remnants. So you have to get the rest of the characters that used to be with the Enclave and then you unlock the bunker, which does get you some cool weapons. It also gets you more dialogue with Ganon. And Ganon does actually have a pretty useful perk where his perk is called Better Healing. Better Healing makes it so you regenerate 20% more health from all consumable sources. So this would count for things like stim packs as well as it would count for food. So Ganon hanging around can actually be really nice just for the extra healing that he gives you, which is very good, especially if you just want to be playing on, a, on the very hard and maybe not the hardcore to where your companions can't die. Ganon, I do like quite a bit. I'm going to put him into the reliable allies. I think he's a pretty solid companion choice overall, and I do really like his backstory as well as uh, the Remnants quest is very interesting. He can get a lot stronger too if you give him better weapons, which is nice, but that's kind of goes for almost any of the companions, at least that can accept weapons. So Ganon is not really one of my personal favorites. I know he is of a lot of people in the New Vegas community, which I totally get, but he's just not personally one of mine, so I would put him there. Uh, this one's going to be an interesting one, and I imagine it's going to be fairly divisive towards the end of this. Again, I don't think any of these companions are bad in New Vegas. I think they're all actually quite good, but it will be interesting to see where people rank uh, the companions for themselves. Up next we have Boone, who is pretty much the, the edgelord of the wastelands, at least of the regular game. Boone is a former NCR sniper, and he was a pretty good NCR sniper when he was in the NCR. He is no longer there, now he protects the town of Novak, him and Manny, who were both sniper partners and Manny would like them to be more than partners, or different kinds of partners, I should say. Boone is a rather sad sack, and he kind of has a reason to be a sad sack and an edgelord, 
because his life has not been going very well for him. Did a whole bunch of horrible things in Bitter Springs and committed some war crimes there, which he has not gotten over at all. He hasn't liked it when his men have been killed in the past, so he is very protective. Uh, his wife was sold into slavery, uh, which he later shot her out of mercy. So there, there was that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that hasn't gone well. He did get revenge on the person who sold his wife into slavery, or at least you can do that for him, which, I mean, yeah, that, that girl should probably die. And he does not like the Legion whatsoever, which is rather understandable, especially given his position. He doesn't really like people all that much, kind of understandably, and you can recruit him. In order to complete his quest, you're going to have to go to various areas, usually involving the Legion and the NCR, and more side with him, which usually results in a bit more of a vengeful Boone coming to kill them. Boone is equipped with his hunting rifle, his signature beret, and his uh, glasses, which I think work really well. The hunting rifle is a pretty strong weapon, and Boone can kill things quite well at a distance. It's also really funny if you give him a 50 cal, because he will murder just about everything with it. To complete his quest is when he opens up a bit more about what actually happened to his wife, what's actually been going on with him, his PTSD that he's been suffering from for years now. And it kind of all culminates in a mission where he plans on dying trying to protect people, trying to protect refugees. This doesn't happen, though, as you and him both manage to fight off the Legion, and keep the people protected. So Boone then dons his new armor. And Boone I actually really like as a companion. He, he's got a lot more complexity to him than quite a few of the characters do. A lot of the, the companions in this actually do have a lot of complexity to them, which I really appreciate. His active perk honestly isn't really the best since it's called Spotter, and this just makes it so hostile targets are highlighted whenever a player is actively aiming. That's okay, but you can already see them on your compass, and assuming you have decent to fairly high perception, you're going to see them probably before this will really matter, since you could just spin around. Vats targeting is also pretty strong in this game, just to find enemies, not necessarily to actually shoot them, but you can just spam that whenever you're walking to an area so that you could kind of see enemies that are in the area, and you should be fine there. So his perk is really where it kind of lets down. Him as a character I think is fantastic, but him as a companion is decent overall. So I'd probably put him in the Reliable Allies too, just because his perk, I guess, pulls him down. I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm really basing this list off of, because if it's just off of perks, then that would be quite a bit different. If it's based off of personality and character development, then it's also going to be based off of quite a few different things. So Boone is probably going to go into Reliable Allies with Ganon here. He's pretty likable, but him being an edgelord all the time does kind of bring a downer to whenever you're just walking around, so I don't always have him as a companion. And then we got Cass, and Cass is pretty cool. She's actually one of the very first companions that you can get since she's hanging out at the trading post down south, and she used to run a caravan. These caravans have pretty much all been destroyed, and she doesn't really have much going for her right now, which is kind of a bummer. You find out later throughout her story that the Van Graffs have been ambushing her caravans and killing the caravan, and stealing everything that's with it, so she doesn't trust them, which good, you probably shouldn't. Doesn't really trust Crimson Caravan either, because they're also fairly corrupt. Maybe not as much as the Van Graves, but still fairly corrupt. And she's mostly siding with the NCR. She doesn't really take a side, though. She's mostly in it for herself. And uh, her backstory is pretty simple, where she just grew up out in the middle of nowhere, learned how to shoot, wanted to start up her own caravan, and she really likes whiskey. Cass has actually a couple different perks related to her, where her main one that she has is called Whiskey Rose. This one negates the negative effects of consuming alcohol, as well as you can't get addicted to alcohol. And whenever you're specifically drinking whiskey or Wasteland tequila, then this also raises the player's damage threshold, so you take less damage when you're doing this. She is armed with a caravan shotgun, which is an okay weapon, it's not way crazy or anything like that. And the perk is fine enough. Drinking to get you a little bit more defense isn't necessarily a bad thing, I guess. In order to do her quest, it's actually one of the easier ones, where you pretty much just have to go around, check her caravans that went missing, and then complete her quest. And you can either end this in two different ways, or I guess three different ways if you want to do Birds of a Feather, because that kind of involves cast dying. The other two ways, you can either get Calm Hearts or the Hand of Vengeance. So in Calm Heart, this makes it so that you turn in evidence towards the NCR of Crimson Caravan and of the Van Graffs of how corrupt they are. 
This will give Cass an extra 50 HP, which is kinda nice. The Hand of Vengeance completion makes it so you take revenge on the Van Graffs and on Crimson Caravan, and that makes it so Cass does 15% more damage with guns, which is also pretty good. You can give her some pretty strong weapons, give her like a riot shotgun, give her a brush gun or something like that, and she can do quite a bit of damage, which is pretty nice. Cass is a pretty likable character, and I do like having her around. Even though she's not really one that I go for right away, usually it's a little bit later. She's probably also another one up into the reliable allies. Oh, then we got Eddie, and there's actually two different versions of Eddie, because there's regular Eddie and there's the Lonesome Road Eddie, and both of them can be pretty useful. So Eddie is a robot, which can actually be the very first companion you get since he's located in Prim. You do need to fix him up. He is an iBot who used to be at the Mariposa base, so he is also technically part of the Enclave kind of unwillingly, similar to Ganon where he was just born into the Enclave. So he is an advanced iBot that knew a lot of secrets and then went out to the wasteland. He made it all the way to Nevada before he got shot and then he ended up in Prim. Eddie mostly talks to you through radio signals and beeps and boops, so he's, he can be a little bit hard to understand sometimes. He also can't really have any weapons outside of the ones that he already has on him, so he pretty much always has a laser gun. Eddie's quest is a little bit weird to get going because you have to go to certain areas and you have to travel so long with Eddie for him to pick up signals. And I find Eddie to be really inconsistent for his quest, which is kind of annoying, as well as his quest is rather short compared to a lot of the other companions, which I guess kind of makes sense since he's the robot. It's kind of the same thing with the next, uh, I guess the next two companions we have to talk about as well. Eddie's unique perk is called the Enhanced Sensors. This detects enemies at further range, and enemies that are cloaked can also be targeted in VATS. There's not a whole lot of cloaked enemies in the game, so that's not such a huge deal. Being de able to detect enemies further just maxes out your perception. I don't really find that to be super useful because a lot of the times you can just physically see the enemy or hear the enemy around you, so you don't really need to have more targeting on them. Eddie's an okay companion, but I'd probably put him in the occasional partner because his quest is just kind of weird and I don't really like how it can just get bugged out sometimes. Eddie in the Lonesome Road DLC is a bit better because he can get his own upgrades there. You can actually get five upgrades to him, which give him all sorts of different things which is very, very nice. He can also repair your gear, which is really good. And he actually makes for a much better companion in that DLC, especially since you kind of need him throughout parts. So even if you're playing on the hardcore difficulty, Eddie can't actually die because he's the only one that can actually unlock locks in that DLC. So they do keep him alive there, which is very nice. In the base game, I don't really use Eddie that much in the Lonesome Road. You're kind of forced to use him and I think he is quite a bit better there. Rex is found with the King. And Rex is a cyber dog, which his brain is kind of going bad. He needs a new brain, which is kind of the whole thing of his quest. He functions as dog meat in this game, which works. Dog meat has been in pretty much every Fallout game. I think he actually has been in every Fallout game so far. Rex has a regular perk to him normally, but then he also get bonuses once you actually complete his brain transfer. So he has Search and Mark, which is his main one. This makes it so chems, firearms, ammunition within a short distance are highlighted while aiming down sights or zooming. This is kind of useful for picking up random stuff, but I mean, you'll probably notice these. There are a couple places where they are fairly well hidden, so it can be a little bit useful there. For the different brains that you can put in him, you've got the Faithful Protector. This is putting in Ray's brain, which Ray is one of the dogs that is found at Old Lady Gibson's place. And this makes it so Rex does an additional 25 more damage, which is pretty good. Rex can only attack with melee, or I don't know if it's counted as melee or unarmed since he can only bite stuff. Well, he can also bark like the cyberhounds can too so if you put lupa's brain into him which is a dog of the legion then he gets blood of the legion which gives him plus 10 more damage threshold so he gets tankier and then if you put violetta's brain into him then he gets the unshakable tracker which is the dog of the fiends and this one increases his movement speed by 50 percent so he can move faster I don't think the movement speed really matters that much for him since a lot of the time he's just going to be following you around. It will make it so he can get into combat a little bit quicker, which is nice, but I think the other two are a little bit better if you want to throw those into him. Rex is fine as a companion. He only has like two quests that are really associated with him, and the main one is just switching out his brain, which is a very easy quest to do, but I don't really use him that much. I'd also put him into the occasional partners. Then we've got Lily. Lily is a nightkin that is found in Jacobstown, and she is one of the least uh, threatening of the Nightkin. She's still a super mutant, so she still has all the bonuses of a super mutant where she's 
big, strong, not super intelligent, although she seems to be more intelligent than some of the super mutants, but she's also kind of confused and always believes you to be her grandchild, so that's kind of funny. She also has some unique weapons with her where she's got an assault carbine and she's also got a vertebrate blade, like one of the helicopter blades that she tore off and turned into a sword. Lily has the perk of Stealth Girl. This makes it so it doubles Stealth Boy effectiveness. She also gives you increased sneak attack crits by an extra 10%, so you do a little bit more damage whenever you hit a sneak crit, which can be pretty cool. And doubling the length of Stealth Boy use can be pretty useful. This also stacks with things like Chemist, which will give you another 50% on it. So Stealth Boys can actually last a really long time if you have Lily around, which can be really good if you want to be stealing stuff or if you just want to be going for those sneak crits. Lily's quest isn't super long either, where you can complete these and where you can determine how much of uh, the different chems that she should be taking, as well as uh, the stealth boy use, because she is the only nightkin that's really trusted to be using stealth boys. Since the nightkin generally have schizophrenia because of their stealth boy use, which is kind of interesting. It's a weird thing that's added into Fallout New Vegas since I believe there's Nightkin actually in Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 as well, but I don't believe that's ever brought up until New Vegas as to why their skin has turned blue and why they are addicted to Stealth Boys, where Stealth Boys don't really have any addiction rates on humans, but they do once they turn to super mutants, so they can be rather violent and a bit scary. Lily is a pretty fun companion to have around, but I think I would just have her as occasional partner too, since I don't use her as often as I do other characters. And then we got Raul. Raul is a ghoul that can be found at the very top of Black Mountain. He has been imprisoned there by the super mutants because he's the only one that can fix up their radios. So that's rather interesting. He's also voiced by Danny Trejo, so that certainly helps with this. Raul was an old school gunslinger from Mexico, pretty much, or sort of bounty hunter, that eventually came to New Vegas. Raul is probably the hardest companion to actually get, because most of the other companions you can just go right up to and talk to. For Raul, you do have to fight your way through Black Mountain in order to get up there, and it is swarming with super mutants, and super mutants in New Vegas tend to be pretty strong. Even in the early game, they're quite strong, because they have better weapons than most enemies. In the late game, they also have better weapons than most enemies, so they don't really fall off at any point. Raul's unique perk is called Regular Maintenance, and this makes it so every weapon and armor decays 50% slower. That is a really big bonus. That is really nice, especially if you're playing with like energy weapons that have very low item health. It can be really, really nice. For other weapons, like this machine, it makes it so they're even more unbreakable than they already were. Your 600 health rifle goes up to 900 health. Raul also has his magnum, and he also has a lead pipe that he uses as a weapon, funny enough. His magnum is pretty strong, the lead pipe, I, it's kind of weird that he has that. I figured a knife would be more fitting for him, but whatever. He's also got his quest, which is called Old School Ghoul. In order to complete this, you have to go around and talk to some of the older members in each of the various communities. So this would be Loyal at Nellis Air Force Base, Corporal Sterling at Camp McCarran, and Ranger Andy at Novak. And it kind of inspires Raul to either stay more retired from his gunslinger life or go back to his more gunslinger roots. Either way, I think it actually works really well for Raul, and he does get two different perks for this depending on which way you side with him. You can either have full maintenance if you tell him that he probably should retire, in which case that 50% bonus turns into a 75% bonus, which is really good for energy weapons. That's really, really nice to have 75% more HP on your armor and on your weapons. Then his other one is called Old Vaquero, where rate of fire with revolvers and lever action rifles is increased by 33%. He also gets new armor based on this, and I, I really like his Old Vaquero outfit. I think that one fits really well, where he's got like the, the poncho, the sombrero. Yeah, Raul's pretty awesome. He's awesome regardless of how you want to go about this. He is a very entertaining character to have around with you always calling you boss. So I'm gonna put him up into Wasteland Warriors. He's one of the ones that I don't really have to worry about dying. Usually like him and Boone don't die very much when playing on hardcore. Lily doesn't either for that matter. You give him like a good lever action or a good revolver, which some of the best weapons in the game are. And Raul is a pretty solid companion having all around good everything, especially his skills. Then we have Veronica. Veronica is a former or still sort of associate of the Brotherhood. She was fully in the Brotherhood and then sort of self-exiled herself, kind of, but not really. She still gets along with them just fine. So she's hanging out in the wasteland, pretending to be, well, not with the Brotherhood. Veronica is pretty interesting because actually her and Christine used to be a couple before Christine went off to go try to kill Elijah. We'll talk about Christine here in a second. Veronica here hasn't really seemed to get past that, which is kind of sad. But she is a very upbeat, she's a very fun character throughout the wasteland. She's pretty much always cracking jokes 
and just very likable across the board, which is nice. The main weapon that she really likes to use is unarmed weapons, and she's really good with them. She can actually do tons of damage with unarmed, especially if you give her some of the stronger unarmed weapons. Like, you give her Grease Lightning, and she'll just go in 1v1 pretty much anything. Veronica has the perk of Scribe Assistant. This makes it so whenever you talk to her, you can use her as a workbench pretty much which is kind of funny. So if you need to craft things from a workbench, you always have a workbench with you. It's not a major perk, but it is something that's kind of a bonus. She actually gets multiple other perks too, depending on how things play out. So if you complete her quest, I could make you care. You get Bonds of Steel, which gives her an additional four damage threshold. So she gets tankier, which is pretty nice. And that's if you convince her to stay with the Brotherhood. If you convince her to leave the Brotherhood, then she gets the perk Causeless Rebel, which increases her melee attack rate by 150%, so she can attack even faster than she already does. So if you give her, again, like Grease Lightning, which has a high attack speed, she attacks really, really quick and can kill everything very, very fast. On top of that, she can actually get another bonus, depending on what you choose for dead money, where if you give Veronica the holo tape messages from Elijah, then this will increase her attack speed by another 150% and give her another 25% chance with melee attacks to knock down enemies. Or you could give her Elijah's Ramblings, which is keep the messages from her after Veronica unlocks it for you, which boosts her melee crit damage by what is supposed to be 50%. It's actually 150%, so it's a lot better than that. <laughs> Meaning that both of these are really good, either one that you want to have on Veronica. And Veronica is really strong as a companion. Her quest is really good, she is very likable, she's just flat out one of the strongest companions in the game, if not the strongest companion to 1v1 pretty much everything. So I'd probably put her up here into Wasteland Warrior, she is a, a lot of fun as a companion. Then we get into some of the DLC companions, where first up we have the Dead Money companions. So first up is Christine, and Christine probably won't actually be the first one you unlock, but again, Christine and Veronica used to be a couple in the Brotherhood. She then left the Brotherhood to go and try to kill Elijah. Elijah is the former Brotherhood Elder who went completely insane, did a bunch of horrible stuff, is still trying to do a bunch of horrible stuff, arguably even worse things. And Christine is pretty much the one who volunteered to go hunt him down and kill him. She's been tracking him throughout the wasteland. She tracked him to Old World Blues where they had their little battle and they both injured one another, but neither one of them died there. Uh, she was actually pretty critically injured and then Ulysses came and saved her and patched her back up. Elijah managed to patch himself up and then run back to the wasteland so he could get into uh, the Sierra Madre so he can try to break into there. Christine followed him there and then she had a bomb collar attached to her thanks to Elijah. Also, sort of thanks to Dean is why she has all the scars across her and why she can't speak anymore once you're in the Sierra Madre. She used to be able to, but she can't now because Dean put her into one of the medical doctors there to rip out her vocal cords. So she's not super happy with a lot of the people there. She is a pretty interesting character though, especially given that she doesn't speak throughout the majority of it. She does have some dialogue because later her voice gets uh, changed to where she can speak like Vera, which is what the casino was pretty much locked for. She's the obsession of Sinclair's thing. Dead Money has a lot of lore to it, so we're not gonna go into all of that. We're just gonna be talking about Christine here. Christine is a pretty interesting character though. I do like her quite a bit. She does have her own perk too, which is called Signal Interference, where whenever you have her as a companion, signals take 50% longer in order to set off your collars. That's actually really good, especially for certain areas like the area where you need to take Christine. This is super useful if it's your first time playing through Dead Money. If it's like your seventh or eighth time playing through Dead Money, it's not that hard to just memorize where all of the radios are, where all the signals are, and which ones you can shoot and which ones you can't. If you can do that, then Christine's perk really isn't that necessary, but it is super useful the first time through. Now, Christine is nowhere near as strong as her girlfriend Veronica, where she will just destroy anything in a 1v1 fist fight. Christine still beats up on the ghost people pretty well, and she can kill some of the things pretty well, but she's not really the strongest companion in Dead Money. I mean, uh, God and Dog kind of are, just by default. But Christine is still pretty decent, and I do like her a lot, so I'm gonna put her up into Reliable Allies. Dean Domino is a ghoul from, well, pre-war. He is a very petty person. <laughs> He is not super likable, he's pretty mean-spirited towards just about everybody, he's fairly cynical too, and he wants into the Sierra Madre. He is very memorable though, which is interesting. He's also probably the biggest pain in the butt in Dead Money to actually complete his quest and make sure that everybody survives, since he's pretty unlikable and most people are probably not gonna side with him or do the things that he wants. 
in order to get all the good dialogue so that you can save everybody at the end of the Sierra Madre. He does have an interesting perk though, where he's got uh, unclean living. This makes it so you have temporary cloud protection and you take 25% less damage from the cloud once that protection sort of wears off. This can be kind of useful. It depends on how you're building to go to dead money since the cloud is only in dead money. If you're gonna go with like a rad child build though and then just run right to dead money, you really don't need him since you're just gonna be out healing the damage the cloud would do anyway and that perk is just really busted in that DLC. Same thing goes if you're going with Them's Good Eating. That's another really crazy perk for that DLC because it basically means that you have infinite healing. Dean is definitely a nasty person. I wouldn't say he's mediocre though. I would probably put him up in occasional partners because he is useful for the DLC. He's just not very likable <laughs> and that's on purpose. He's, he's not supposed to be likable. He can also teach you a recipe on how to make the Sierra Madre Martini, which can be really useful. Christine can also teach you a recipe on uh, how to make the Sierra Madre slugs. So you can just make those whenever you'd like to get more money uh, at that DLC, which is kind of nice. We have God slash Dog. These are the same person. This is a Nightkin that has schizophrenia and basically two separate personalities. So one of them is God, one of them is Dog. Dog is more of your stereotypical super mutant, or in this case, Nightkin, where he's very paranoid, he's very violent, he likes to kill the ghost people that are around the casino, and he will eat the people in the casino. He's also very durable for a super mutant, even more so than most it seems like, since he ate his own bomb collar. He has a bear trap attached to his arm, he's carved his name into his chest, and that's all quite a lot given how fast super mutants are supposed to heal. So either he carved his name into his chest pretty deep and it still hasn't been able to heal, or he does it fairly regularly. Either way, he's a pretty tanky individual, and as Dog, he is really scary towards the ghost people. God, on the other hand, is pretty much the complete opposite, where he is a lot more cognitively there, he can speak more clearly, he is not nearly as violent, he's not nearly as strong as dog is so they switch off of their personalities to kind of keep one alive over the other where in a combat situation dog is obviously going to be a whole lot better and then in a regular personable conversation god is going to be a whole lot better to speak they can become one person by the end of their quest depending on how you complete this because by the end of it dog is planning on blowing the casino up with himself inside so that's not good and that will kill him and in time kind of kill you thanks to the bomb collars all being linked together but if you can talk to him then you can convince them to become one person where they seem more cognitively there but they are then confused as to who they are why they're there what the heck is going on and i think that's kind of the best ending for this they also have two different perks depending on who is out so if you have god out then you have in my footsteps which makes it so traps don't activate and you're given a slight stealth increase which is nice it's basically lightfoot if you already have lightfoot then his perk doesn't really help you all that much but there is a lot of traps in dead money so that can be useful they're also very difficult to see so even on multiple playthroughs i still step through bear traps and on landmines all the time in that dlc and then if you have god out then you get ravenous hunger which makes it so he can more likely devour the ghost people meaning that they can't revive themselves this can also be pretty strong and there is a lot of ghost people there so if he's out you should probably have that so that he can just rip them apart you yourself can rip them apart too if you have like the bear trap fist it's super easy to rip them apart since it has extra limb damage on it you just go into vats and spam like your cross assuming that you have that otherwise you just spam whatever you got and that tends to work really well too God and Dog are pretty interesting. I think I'd also put them up into the reliable allies as well. I like their backstory. I like them as a whole, even though they can be a little bit of a pain to go back and forth. They're also kind of buggy in the DLC. I have had them just kind of bug out and not work the way they're supposed to either. Follows Chuck is the very first companion that you meet once you go to Honest Hearts and you're gonna kind of be hanging out with him. He's part of the Dead Horses, which is the tribe that's led by Joshua Graham. He kind of wants to go out and explore the world outside of Zion rather than being with his tribe. Uh, his perk really isn't the best where it makes it so if you're in specific locations, it gives you plus three perception and reveals certain parts of the map. That's not really that great. Plus three perception for just being in specific areas just isn't that good. Perception just isn't a great thing to be maxing out anyway. 
So uh, really on any build it's not really that good since it will only really give you temporary bonuses or give you distance to see enemies. In this one it doesn't affect vats so it's just not that great. He does kind of have one or two quests associated with him. First one is just go and get some big horners and move them around so it's kind of like an escort mission although it's a pretty easy escort mission. And then his other one is just do his regular quest where you're going around and collecting all the things that Joshua wants. He's an okay companion, but I think I'd put him into mediocre. He doesn't really stand out like some of the others. His backstory isn't all that interesting, nor is like the conclusion to his story. I think the characters in Honest Hearts, aside from Joshua and Daniel, are a little bit lacking compared to other ones. I do kind of understand the limitations of having to be like a tribe, but I still feel like you could do more with them than what they did do. Uh, speaking of which, we also have the next companion, which is uh, Walking Cloud. Walking Cloud is part of the Sorrows. This is the more peaceful tribe in Zion. They are still friends with the dead horses, but the dead horses tend to be more hunters and kind of warriors, where these guys tend to be a lot more pacifist, uh, at least to some extent. Daniel himself is mostly a pacifist, although I do like his version of being a pacifist in the Wasteland, more so than some of the others that just kind of claim to be pacifists and you just kind of wonder how they didn't die, like right away. Daniel at least kind of makes sense where he doesn't actively go out to try to attack people, but if anybody tries to come near him that has any sort of ill will, he'll gun them down without any trouble. Like that, that's not a problem for him. So I do kind of like that a bit more. Walking Cloud doesn't really have much of a personality to her, which is a little bit sad to say. Her perk is called Quiet as Waters, which makes it so White Lake's perception is effectively decreased by three which also doesn't really matter. I guess they're less likely to see you on their map, but lowering their stats doesn't really matter. And, and again, perception just doesn't really matter here. Her quest really isn't that interesting either because you can go around to all the areas that Daniel wants you to go to and you'll get a little bit more backstory on her. But mostly you could just talk to her and talk to Daniel and get the whole backstory where she is pretty upset at Daniel for not telling her that her husband recently died. And that's kind of where this whole story ends. So Walking Cloud, I think, is one of the weaker companions, too. I'd put her in Mediocre Companion. She's not bad or anything. I don't mind her, but I feel like that there could have been a whole lot more done with her. And then we got Joshua Graham. Joshua Graham, you can also get in Zion. You can only really get him for the final mission, though. And Joshua Graham by himself is an amazing character. He is really, really good. And then you get him as a companion who he is probably the strongest companion in the game besides maybe like Veronica in terms of just damage that he can deal. His perk is called the Way of the Canaanite. This decreases the spread and doubles the crit chance of all 45 pistols. He uses a 45 pistol that shoots very fast and does a lot of damage. And he also has above average stats in pretty much everything, as you would kind of expect Joshua Graham. He will gun down pretty much everybody in that DLC. You could just have him go by himself and he'd probably clear up everything for you. It is just rather unfortunate that you do get him at the very, very end. I guess we should also talk about the backstory of Joshua. He was the original legate of Caesar's Legion. He was the second in command, and he was the one who failed to take the dam during the first Battle of Hooper Dam. He was then covered in pitch, lit on fire, and thrown into the Grand Canyon. That didn't kill him though. <laughs> he got back up and walked his way back to Utah, and Caesar has sent many, many people to try and go and kill him. They have all failed. Nobody's been able to kill Joshua. He is a ghost story of the Legion and a very terrifying one to pretty much all the Legionaries, but he has calmed down quite a bit from when he was the Legate. When he was the Legate, he was very ruthless and he was a pretty evil person or a pretty bad person, maybe not entirely evil. He has come around to a redemption though, and Joshua's redemption is probably one of the best stories and best arcs in the Fallout series as a whole. As a companion, I think I'm going to put him as like the reliable ally because he is really strong there. As a character, he's probably top tier because he does have just some of the best voice lines. He has an amazing voice actor. He's just got a super interesting backstory, and I love how his character growth goes from him being somebody that started out pretty good and trying to do good things to doing bad things, getting worse, turning into a warlord, having his fall quite literally down the Grand Canyon on fire. And then as we see him in Zion, where he is getting his redemption, and if you do all of his quests, and complete it with a speech check at the end, that feels like the most complete story of him, where he does really let go of a lot of the past things that he would do, and is becoming a lot better of a person. So I do really like Joshua for that. He's probably also one of the most well-done religious characters I've ever seen in pretty much anything, which is rather interesting because he is very religious, but he never really comes off as 
necessarily like a zealot or very pretentious about this or very much using religion to justify a lot of the horrible things that he did. This is just his faith that he's following or trying to follow the best that he can. So even when he is bringing up parts of the Bible and the Book of Mormon, he's not really preaching to you in any way. It's just the way in which he's interpreting things. So I do really like that about Joshua. Maybe that isn't really the best way to put it, but Joshua is a very, very interesting character. Just as a companion, I'm going to put him here. And then we have a much more simple character where we have Roxy. Roxy can be found in Old World Blues, and she doesn't really have a quest associated with her. You can just make her, so long as you combine a robo brain and a dog. And then you get Roxy, and she can follow you around. She basically does everything the same way Rex does, which is pretty awesome. There is a cool little uh, bonus if you make Roxy, where you get Roxy and Rex uh, having puppies, having cyber puppies afterwards. So that is pretty awesome. Um, I guess I'd put Roxy into the mediocre companions, though, because she doesn't really have a story to her. You just make her an Old World Blues, and then you can have her pretty much as a replacement for Rex if you want. Uh, and then we got Ulysses. Ulysses is sort of a companion. He's more of a temporary companion. He was meant to be a companion, though, in the game, which is why he's here on this list. So he was meant to be a companion that you can get after Lonesome Road, assuming that you talk Ulysses down from just trying to nuke everybody and trying to kill you. And if you do that, then he will join you, or at least he was supposed to join you. He still joins you for that part afterwards where you have to fight through all of the marked men, and he's very, very strong. Ulysses is probably the strongest NPC in... I'm going to say all of Fallout because he has really strong weapons. He has bonuses with his little eye bots that can heal him and cloak him. He's strong in melee range. He's strong at long range. He's strong at close range. I think he's the only character in any of the Fallout games that actually has a maxed out special skill where he has 10 in everything. So he's just amazing at everything. He used to be a courier like you where he would deliver messages around the wasteland. He was also part of the Legion, but he's no longer either of those things anymore. He's disowned the Legion and he's disowned his life sort of as a courier. He is obsessed with history and he does have a really cool voice. I like his voice and his VA is really good. There's a little bit of a problem with that though, and that is that Ulysses can linger on for a very long time throughout the game. And he really likes to hear himself talk, so. There, there is that. He also kind of talks himself in circles too at points, and he is a bit of a hypocrite throughout his reasoning as well. So Ulysses can be a little bit unlikable because of that. I really like Ulysses. I think he's a very solid final antagonist for New Vegas, especially with everything that's built up and with the fact that so many people know him. Like when you talk to Joshua and Honest Hearts, he knows of Ulysses and he figured he would be the one showing up, not you. In Old World Blues, he saved Christine from Elijah and Elijah knows of him as well as a lot of the Brotherhood seems to know of him. So he's been a, kind of a major player throughout the wasteland, but he only really reveals himself in Lonesome Road, which is supposed to be the main conclusion to New Vegas between you and him as to what's going to actually play out. And assuming that you do talk him down, then he does become your companion and he will just absolutely wreck every part of the Marked as you would kind of expect. He's very high leveled, he has maxed out stats and pretty much everything, so he can definitely hold his own. He's also very difficult to kill if you want to fight him because he has a lot going for him. Recently I actually did a 10 times enemy run, or at least somewhat recently, I did a 10 times enemy run on New Vegas. And it didn't spawn 10 Ulysses, but it did spawn 10 times the amount of iBots that were floating around him, giving him shields and healing him, which made it so he was functionally immortal. So Ulysses, um, I'm going to put him in occasional partner, just because you do only get him for that, and it would be really cool to see him as a companion after the events of Lonesome Road, but unfortunately that never happened. So we do only get him for that, so it's kind of a missed opportunity there with Ulysses. And I guess this is where I'd put all of the companions. Now, most of these are really good, and you could easily move them around. I think a lot of them have really good backstories. Uh, a lot of them are very interesting, and they're a lot more memorable than probably any of the other Fallout games, in my opinion. I don't really take companions that much throughout these games, with the exception of, like, Fallout Tactics, because it's kind of necessary, or it would be kind of dumb not to. But New Vegas definitely has a lot of standout characters in it. Tell me your thoughts and who you would rank where, which ones are your favorite companions, which ones are your least favorite companions, and why that might be. Thank you guys so very much for watching this. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.